planning a course and we'll also talk about assessment and I know assessment is important to a lot of people and it is at the end because logically that's how it went for me so if we end up at 90 minutes and people are thinking oh my gosh we didn't get to assessment I am willing to stay longer and I know Chris is um, is recording this so I will definitely address assessment and then of course your questions but please um, please know that you can ask questions at any time um, and I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible if there were 20 or 30 of you um, there would be a lot more opportunity I think for us to actually talk but we'll definitely use the chat and we'll use other tools to make sure that, that we get your voices heard so in the chat, if you could just type in, what are your preconceptions about online instruction? And I'm gonna be staring at the chat here for a minute so I can see what you say. While people are typing, um, the, uh, uh, let me sh share for everybody's benefit. Uh, yes, you are gonna get these slides and we are recording. I did not say that at the beginning, which that's a good practice to do. You should tell people you're recording always in case they wanna duck out their camera or something like that. Um, so there you go. We're recording and you will get the slides. Some good answers in the chat box already. Yep, I'm seeing a lot about lecture, a lot of sit and get, not a lot of active learning or engagement. Having to front load, that is, that is definitely true. Difficult to get authentic participation. Yes, yeah, students will turn in when it works for them. Yep. Ah, really good point. Um, need to hit the ground running to set expectations. We're gonna talk about that. Really hard to adapt. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna have a lot of opportunities to answer in chat here. And I will tell you that is one thing that really worked with my AP Macro students this spring. They were very shy about talking. Um, but they were pretty willing to put responses in the chat. And so that's something we definitely wanna take advantage of with, with our students. Okay, so here's a few common preconceptions. Um, first of all, that idea that it's all sit and get, that it's webinar style. Um, it doesn't have to be. I, it, it really shouldn't be. Um, I realize that that's kind of the, the immediate fallback is, well, all I can do is talk to my students on the, on the video camera. Um, they're not even putting their images up, if, even if they have a, a camera. Um, they're just here to receive. And, and so I'm going to give you some ideas for things that we can do um, to get away from that webinar style presentation. This is an unusual day for me, actually, because I usually don't even use PowerPoint slides um, because I, I use a lot the document camera or smart notebook so that it's, it's less can't, that less of it is actually prepared ahead of time. Um, Online instruction can be engaging. I know it's, it's much more of a challenge, right? Because we don't have that casual give and take. We can't walk up to a student's desk and kind of joke around with them or ask them what they did on the weekend. But there are definitely things, strategies we can use that will make it more engaging. So again, that's what we're gonna work on today. One big preconception is that the technology dictates how we teach. And if there's one, one point that I hope you'll take away from today, it's decide what you want to do first and then figure out how to make the technology do it okay so plan your teaching as you always would and then figure out what technology is going to help me do this and i was really glad uh, to hear chris say they're working on on figuring out how to how to make simulations work i know there's some teachers ap econ teachers in the facebook page sharing ideas for online simulations the more we can share ideas like that that's fantastic because our students will definitely benefit also we often believe we're gonna to have to learn all kinds of new technologies. And you really can do a lot of online teaching without learning a whole lot of tools. But I, I will tell you that when I started teaching online 10 years ago, um, I, my school district had, was using Moodle and that's what I've used for my course. So when you see the examples from my course later, that's what they'll be from. It was totally worth it to learn how to use Moodle. And I don't know, your school district may have Canvas, Moodle, they may just say Google Classroom. Um, but once you kind of, get over the, the hump and figure out how to use it, having a learning management system is really helpful because it, it can move you away from that temptation to just um, post things on a website, just videos and, and, and worksheets. And it can allow you some opportunities to interact more and let the students interact more with each other. Finally, 
activities, discussions, inquiries, many can be modified, not everything. You might ask me a question today, how can I modify this activity and I might be completely stumped, I don't know. There's some things that I figured out how to modify and there's other things that I have yet to figure out how to modify, but um, the more we can share those ideas, I think the, the better off we'll be. So we're gonna start by looking at these best practices for online instruction. And as it says at the bottom, they're not so different from our face-to-face -face best practices. So here is, and I saw a question here, what is, it, what is Smart Notebook? So Smart Notebook is software that goes with a smart board. And, and because I do have a smart board at school, even though I haven't touched it in months and months, I have the, that software on my computer. So I often use that um, because I can draw much more easily with it. So I know there's other softwares and maybe people can share also in the chat software they've used, things that they can use on an iPad or whatever resources you have that allow you to draw and, and you know, do things interactively in the moment. So this is just a, an overview. Um, we're gonna talk about synchronous best practices and then we'll talk about asynchronous best practices. Under the synchronous ones, we'll talk about student voice, small group collaboration and shared work and how to kind of throw surprises in for the students. Um, in asynchronous best practices, we'll talk about setting up a weekly structure, setting clear expectations and deadlines. I put simulations under asynchronous. They could, they kind of fit under both. So when we get to the simulation part, we're gonna kind of go back to the synchronous as well. And then discussions can happen online as well. Practice with feedback, real world examples, and again, strategies that can, can build in an element of surprise and make the kids wanna show up because you're gonna do something that they didn't expect. Okay, so for synchronous learning, we really, really want to elevate student voice, right? We don't want the students to be passive recipients. So one way to do that is through the chat, right? And I'm gonna look back at our chat right now. Um, we have a few, okay, <laughs> no, last one's on the smart notebook. Um, we can use polls and there's a lot of different, different ways to do polls. There's polling in Zoom, um, there's poll everywhere, there's Socrative quizzes and cahoots. Um, we're gonna use one called Mentimeter. There's games that we can have students play that will bring their voice in. And then we can also bring their voice in through, through smaller group collaboration. So we'll do a little practice with breakout rooms, with shared workspace, and with Google Slides. Okay, so first of all, we are going to go to this Mentimeter poll. And I'm gonna show you this, this page before we go to the actual poll. So you can see if you use this particular program, it lets you set up multiple choice questions, word clouds, open-ended questions, scales, rankings, Q and A's, all kinds of things you can use to get your students to give you feedback. So we're gonna go to this. And if you'll go to www.menti.com and put in this code, the question for you is, what is your favorite thing about teaching economics? So basically it's forming a live word cloud for us, which is kind of cool and fun to watch. And you can imagine students enjoy that a little bit more than just typing a response <laughs> into a chat box, right? Um, it's clear that we all share a lot of the same, you know, a lot of the same passions for economics. Real world application, real world applications and real world connections are the top three, right? And then we have, well, simulations in there as well. So. I, I set up this account free 
um, and I know you can also pay for an account um, through menti.com, but you can have, you can make a lot of use of this. It's just as something to start the day with your students. Okay, I'm going to go back to these slides and this next one is going to take a while. I'm just going to warn you, it hates loading. So it's, it, you can see the, the spinning wheel. I, I really thought a couple times about like, do I really want to do this? Like how much do I really care? Um, and I'm like, well, we're going to try it. So if it takes very long, we'll, we'll, I'll change my tune. Now you can, for, for 10 bucks or so, you can buy the music to go with this. I did not. <laughs> I went with the free, like, I can online download slides. Here we go. Who wants to be a millionaire? Okay, this time you have to answer, put your answer in chat. And if you don't want students to see each other's responses, you can have them chat them directly to you. So you guys are sharing with everyone, and that's awesome. But obviously, in the case of a class, that's kind of like everyone looking around to see who's raising their hands, right? So thank you. Um, and I did not add in the little highlight slide, but you guys are all correct. Everybody's getting this one right. So it's just kind of fun because it gives you know the kids a little bit more of a sense that this is a game show, right, rather than just econ class. Martha, can I interrupt you there real quick? Please. One second? Yep. Uh, in so for those of you who are going to be using Zoom, um, Martha just said something there casually, but a lot of people don't know how to do what she just said. But when you pull up the chat box, uh, if you're the host of the meeting, I don't know if you can see this on the participant side, but if you're the host of the meeting, uh, on the right hand side of the chat box, there's the three little dots, the ellipses. If you click that, there's an option there that says participants can chat with, and you can click host only. And then they only, the responses only go to you and they can't chat with each other. And then you can read what they're saying and then you can very quickly just switch it back to everyone uh, publicly and privately. But uh, I think that's a really cool feature that not a lot of people um, are using. And of course, now we're gonna get, my system won't use Zoom. Oh, we already got one. All right, there's Fulton County, boom. Yeah, sorry about that. But if you're using Zoom, I love that feature. So you can turn off the chat box. Um, yeah, all right, sorry, Martha. No, not at all. Please interrupt. And if anyone has a question also, you know, please feel free to, um, you know, put that in chat. And Chris, if you could let me know, if you see people asking questions that I should be pausing to answer, totally happy to do it. Yep. Okay, I'm going to throw you guys into breakout rooms for a minute. Um, and you have a little assignment, and that is to discuss what is the best example of a public good. All right, I will see you back shortly. So you're going to get an invitation. So you just have to accept the invitation. Mike Raymer, I put you in a room, but you didn't join them. You're, you're muted. There you go. No. So you just got them in a breakout room for the whole hour and a half? That's right. Yep. Done. Perfect. 
Now nah, I'll give them a minute. I'll give them a minute. That's all. That's what all they can. Uh, they're discussing what's the best example of a public good, but you have to give them a minute or two to introduce themselves first. So I went okay. and I went and joined Walt's room for a minute just to say hi. Okay, cool. And Chris tells me you got a, a 70 people involved. Yeah, that's great. Yep, 73. That's even better. <laughs> that's even three better. That's yes. better than 70. You, you technically better. make 74, but yeah. All right, I'm going to pull them back. I don't want okay. them to. Uh, I don't want them to get too. You know, like when are we coming back? Yeah, All right. Martha, that's a good point though, because like these breakout rooms are interesting because sometimes people just sit there in silence, and then other times they spend like three minutes introducing themselves and where do you teach? Where do you teach? <laughs> Very true. Very Actually, true. They, and it can go either way. And you never know. Depends on who's in the room. All right. Some people are already coming back. So I'm going to give them a warning. 60 seconds. I know some people will hang out to the very last second. It's really funny too to see that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mute myself now. Perfect. Martha, are you about to go to that first bit.ly link? Um, yeah, in a I am. Okay. I'm, I'm yep, in just a minute. Okay, I see a question. Welcome back, everyone. Good to have you all back. Um, uh, Tina Gentry asks, can you use breakout rooms in Google Meet? My understanding is that that is being, that is being created. I haven't seen it yet, but I heard that the plan was to have the breakout rooms on Google Meet ready for this fall. So fingers crossed, because I know in my district right now, using Zoom is not necessarily kosher. Um, but hopefully breakout rooms are, are, are hugely important. Um, I have not, yeah, we are not, I know, I don't know if we're going to be allowed to use them either. Um, has anyone used breakout rooms in WebEx trainings? I haven't used those um, in WebEx trainings. Hopefully, it's going to be in, in Google Meet soon. Um, it's really helpful. What I saw, I did this a lot this summer, and I did it, I did it with my students last spring. Um, people like to be in the same breakout room. So one thing to think about is if you, you know, if you throw people into a breakout room, at least for the day um, or maybe for the week, keep them in the same breakout room because people like to go in and, and introduce themselves. And I definitely have found that students are 100 times more likely to talk in a group of three or four than they are in this setting, even if it's, I mean, 30 people, right? Um, yeah, I don't know how many Zoom allows. I, I gave you 20. Um, <laughs> Nora says, I'm worried about them doing odd behaviors. Can you limit what they do? Um, you probably can't limit them what they talk about, the topics they talk about. I do, I jumped in on one of the breakout rooms here. You can jump in on rooms at any time. You can move between them and see what they're doing. Um, you can say hi and you can have them have something they need to report out. So, um, you know, if I were to, to jump in and see something inappropriate, of course, that would, I would have to discuss that with students. Um, Okay, I'm seeing lots and lots of questions here. Um, concerned about loading different apps. It seems like I will have only 50 minutes once a week synchronous. Yeah, I would say you probably only want to use maybe two or three things in a particular day when you're synchronous. You don't want to, everything I'm going to show you today, you don't want to do these all at once because you will feel overwhelmed switching back and forth in between. But one week you can try one and the next week maybe do something else. Um, I don't know if Teams has breakout rooms. Eric is asking. I, I don't have the answer to that question. No. Can you no, choose? I, I use them this week. They do not. They do not. You can choose. You can assign people into breakout rooms. Yep, you can pre-populate them. Now, I don't know. I think you can set it up. It depends on the Zoom account you have. I think you can set up the breakout rooms and keep them and assign them. I know you can go in once you're logged in and you can, you can manually assign people. And if you have a class of like 30, um, as opposed to, you know, 75, it doesn't really take all that long. You just go through each person and just plop them into whichever room you want them in. So I definitely found it super, super useful. Okay, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And we'll look at another, another interactive tool you can use with students, and that is this Jamboard. And this is um, through um, Google, and it's free. Um, if your students are, if it's a, a Google school like our school is, um, all our students have Gmail accounts. So they can, they can have this um, and they can set up a Jamboard. So what I want you to the do. The link is in the, the, the uh, chat box. You can just directly click that link. Go on and join and, um, and just put a post-it note. 
So you can just say hi, you can say uh, your name if you want, you can call out your state if you want. I put the little welcome to my Jamboard post-it note. And if you're not sure how, it's right over here. So you can click on sticky note, write what you want, and save it. Ah, somebody found the drawing tool as well. Oh. Oh, there's too many people on it. Is it, Holly, did it give you a message that it wouldn't let you get in because there were too many? Well, I'm guessing with your students, you wouldn't have 75 people access. <laughs> Picture of Walt. <laughs> um, my students worked on these in groups of, um, of like three or four. So they were able to get in um, and, and work collaboratively to draw graphs and make suggestions. Um, and, and you can have them even set up sort of expectations about, um, you know, I'm going to draw the graph today and you're going to put comments on post-it notes or, you know, you're going to draw the graph today and I'll put comments on post-it notes. Martha, can I throw some in here? I, I love this. I haven't thought about using this, but if everybody, it looks like, can drag the stuff around. So I yeah. think there'd be some really cool potential here to do like everybody type in a piece of the circular flow model and then, you know, oh, Alyssa yeah. Smith, drag it around to make the correct graph or that kind of thing. This is really cool. I like this. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be using this with um, my entrepreneurship students too when they do, you know, brainstorming around solutions and stuff. Anything where you would use like, you know, post-it notes or post-it voting for things, you can, you can use it here. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's going to be better when it's a smaller group, right, where you have a massive number of people doing this today. So smaller groups are always going to make things a little bit easier. Okay, I'm going to show you um, the next one. Let me, I'm going to close out of the, the jam board. I'm not kicking you out of it, obviously. Um, but I'm going to go to this. So Miro, I'm not giving, I didn't give you the link to my board because I have a limit on the number of people who can sign on to it. So you can go to Miro.com, but it won't take you to this particular board. Um, Miro was offered free to teachers in the spring. And so that's when I set this account up for my students to use. Um, it's like Jamboard. It's got a few more things, right? It's got a few more little toys and tools. And I was going to have you guys um, use it. But like I said, I realized I don't know how to kick people out of it. So I want to make sure I, I save those um, for my students. But you can see there's a few more tools here. There's templates they can use. There's text they can write. There's also sticky notes, shapes, um, connection lines. So it's a little bit easier for graphing because you can actually, you know, draw straight lines um, as opposed to, oops, you can move the, that around. Um, and you can, you can put comments. So you can say, um, not a great graph. Martha, <laughs> if you want to have people put comments in, um, you can set up a frame, um, you can upload, um, you can move objects in the canvas. So there's a lot, there's just more tools on Miro, um, but otherwise it's, it's basically just a little fancier upgrade of Jamboard. Um, I don't know if it's better than Notability because I honestly haven't used Notability. So, and yes, Nora points out in Canvas, there's a whiteboard function. Um, these for sharing with teachers, um, I had my students either, the students who used Miro, they added me to their team so that, that I could see with the work that they did. This allows them to upload so they could upload and share it with you that way. Um, the kids who were using Jamboard typically took, somebody took a screenshot and shared it with me. So there's a lot of different ways to have students share back their work. Another way, what we're gonna do, look at next is something very simple that we're all familiar with, which is Google Slides. So students could draw a graph here and then you could have them share their graph by using Google Slides. So you can even have like a, a gallery walk. So go ahead and go to, um, Chris I think is gonna share this link, add a slide, um, on it write your favorite topic, and then put your name in the notes. And so we could have students all add their graphs, um, images that they wanted to add, we could have them add um, their example of a public good, oops, <laughs> somebody's editing my title. <laughs> so you want to go to um, new, 
not new presentation. Sorry, you want to go to new slide or just control M. So I can see a lot of you are adding new slides. Um, you can do this with your class. You could have the students report out what they drew on the Jamboard, put it in a Google slideshow, and then bring the students back to a whole group and have them share what their group came up with. So Nora, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a great solution to that. I guess I wouldn't use this for any kind of summative assessment um, because I wouldn't necessarily believe that they, you know, that this was their, their own work. But if they're just playing around with it and they're doing practice, um, I didn't really have trouble with students, you know, trying to just put in an image from the internet because they were just working together um, and not expecting to get a grade on it. Okay, let's see, we have trade balance. We have I love teaching, the market structure graphs. Economic systems, externalities. We got a great variety here. We could have a we could have an all-star lineup here. Everybody teach their own their own favorites. Supply and demand, policy making, indicators, monetary policy, externalities again. West Ham United and Mainza. Okay, I don't know what that is. Unemployment, monetary policy, imperfect company. Ooh. Wow, racial income and wealth gaps. Yep, really important topic. And here's a, a case where it's really useful to have kids pull in a graph from the internet, right? Maybe what, what they might want to share is something that they found. Maybe you send the kids to Fred and have them find a graph of something specific and let them um, put that into the Google Slides. Uh, good, good point. Although Chandler says, um, assign each student a slide number so it isn't crazy. I actually did that with my psych students in the spring and they all went in and used each other's slides anyway. I gave them a number and then the kid who had that number was like, well, somebody took mine. So <laughs> it's, definitely, um, it's definitely a little bit of a challenge. I love Nora's idea, good first day starter to see what they already know, absolutely. And you can also do, if you do Mentimeter and you come up with that you know, word cloud, then you can take a, a, a snapshot of that and put it onto the, the Google Slides as well. A uh, number of the breakout room. I, I like that idea a lot. Ah, nice. Yep. You guys have, there's so many great ideas here. This is awesome. I love watching this chat. You guys are, so, are uh, the interaction is, is amazing. Love all these ideas. Okay. And then, yeah, do share. What is the, the intro activity? I think, um, Chris, the chat does share, I mean, it does save immediately, right? Like you automatically save it. Yes, I believe so, yeah. And I can uh, absolutely uh, save it at the end and send it out. Sure. sure, Pamela, go ahead. So Mark Shug said, write the word economics on the board, turn to your buddy and brainstorm everything you know, all words that start with E that have to do with economics. And then you do that for each letter of it. And of course, some are duplicates, so you don't do those. And then you debrief like a think, pair, share kind of thing. And so you're setting the tone for your classroom and figuring out what they know and guiding them to the definition of economics. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Does anyone else have any idea that it would just be easier to share aloud right now? Does anyone else want to take a, a minute to, to share some idea, even something that you just sparked an idea right now? <laughs> yeah, okay, Eric. I don't believe it. Okay, while we transition, I'm gonna give you my first little surprise slide. It's really silly, um, but students love this, right? This, this, I used to show this always in, um, in, in psych, and it just gives, it's a good like end of the day. Oops, ads, we don't want ads. Hold on. That's what I get for not preparing it ahead of time. Here you go. Did you share your computer's audio? Oh my goodness, hold on, yep. I got to start that again. See, that's there you that, go. That's that real first, person thing you were talking about. My first big boo-boo. Okay, here we go. Okay. Yes, this is no fun without the audio. I literally cannot watch 
this without laughing. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop. Um, that's just to, um, hold on, hold on. Okay, there we go. Um, that's just to, uh, you know, put everybody in a good mood, right, before we, before we move on. But it's always fun to give kids a little, like, um, oops, sorry, I'm going to stop share for a second. So I did this to myself again. If I share and I don't um, undo the, the sharing computer sound, then you all go away and I can't see people anymore. And for some reason that really throws me off if I can't see any, you all disappear. So at the beginning or end of the day, it, if you have little fun video clips, just silly things, right? It, that really helps um, just get the students in the mood and think, out, what's she gonna do today, right? What's he gonna do? To, I, I don't know what to expect, I don't wanna miss it. So um, just little fun stuff. Okay, anyone um, have a question right now? If you wanna type in chat or Raise your hand. Yes, puppy videos. Oh my goodness. I love puppies. So puppy videos. I do also still teach psych, yes. And I also teach psych as a, um, an online a hybrid course. Yep. So um, Alan asked if I use PowerPoint or Google Slides. I'm using PowerPoint today. I sometimes use Google Slides. I usually use Smart Notebook Slides in Econ. Um, and I can show you that at the end. Um, uh, Stephanie, I would be happy to run one for Psych if someone wants to sponsor it. <laughs> I'm not sure the, minute the Georgia Council wants to sponsor a Psych workshop, um, but I would be happy to. Uh, <laughs> he's like, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't have a, a, a sponsor to do a psych workshop. Ah, I like that. Every 20 minutes brain break for 20 seconds. Yep, yep. Okay. I love it. Let's find a sponsor. Okay. Um, now, Chris, I'm not seeing the way I have the screens right now. I'm not seeing if there are raised hands. So if it's possible for you, um, to see raised hands, if anyone has a hand up, let me know. Uh, I think you're good. I think everybody's okay. using the chat box primarily. Okay. Um, and Miro, um, I believe the post-it notes are anonymous. Um, so yeah, I don't know um, that you would be able to use that to see who is sharing something inappropriate. That is one nice thing about having the Google Suite is that things, you can tell who added things. Um, yeah, it would you would have to have certainly a, a level of of trust with the students about, about using the Miro board. Okay, we are going to move to asynchronous, but keep in mind, I put the simulations under asynchronous, so we will talk about simulations and do, do a little practice one here or two. Um, if you're teaching asynchronously, um, the most important thing is, is to have a structure, right? I, when I set up my course, and I'll talk a little bit more about AP Micro as we, we get a little bit further along, um, I set it up in one week at a time. And, and to be very clear with the students about what the expectations were for each week, um, I found that in general, it was most helpful to um, set up very clear expectations that the, everything was gonna be due. Basically, I made everything due either on Sunday night or Monday night. My class meets on Tuesdays. So Sunday night is great because then I know if things have been turned in um, by Monday and then I can, on Monday, I can reach out to the students and to their parents and say, this work wasn't turned in before I see them in class on Tuesday. So having, I, I found that if I stagger the deadlines and I have some things due on Wednesday and some due on Friday, it doesn't work at all. It, it takes away the flexibility that students need to be able to plan their own time. Now there is a drawback, right? And that, that some students are gonna wait to do everything on Sunday night at 10 o'clock. Probably a lot of students will wait to do everything. So I definitely give them, I, I give them a calendar at the beginning um, to say, here's how you could plan out your time. Here's what you should do each day. Everything is due Sunday, but here's a suggested plan. And then that is a, an important talking point for students who are falling behind, that I can talk to their parents about, you know, about that time management piece. Um, if needed, I can set 
more specific deadlines during the week for individual students. Um, but I find the majority of students are much more successful if I give them that flexibility to do things when it fits in with their schedule. I see a couple of questions. Yeah, okay. Um, how long is my class on Tuesday? Um, it is one hour. Is one hour. I have one hour with them and, and it actually, my Tuesday micro class, it's a zero hour. So they come in before school starts. So it, they come in at about 7.30. So they have from 7.30 to 8.30 and then 8.35 their, their actual first hour class starts. Um, so yeah, people have answered. The breakout rooms, yep, very intuitive. Okay. Um, it's important to integrate as much as possible simulations, both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, there are some things that we can do asynchronously. Um, discussions are super important asynchronously. If, if you do nothing else with a, a learning management system, incorporating student discussions into it is huge. Um, also, the nice thing about having a, a learning management system is the ability to set up practice problems with immediate feedback for students. Um, now, obviously, we, we, if you're teaching AP, you can also do that through AP Classroom, and I, I now do both. I have things that are set up on my Moodle site, and I assign students um, additional AP Classroom questions. Um, but if students are working on their own, you know, they're doing some practice problems on a Saturday night. <laughs> well, maybe not, right? But they're doing it on, say, Saturday morning when they get up at 11, um, and they get it wrong. They, they want to know why, and they can't talk to you right away. So having explanations um, built in as much as possible is huge. And that's a really nice thing about the, um, the topic questions and the PPCs for those of us teaching AP, is that those questions do provide students with immediate feedback. And then bringing in real world examples is huge in teaching asynchronously. And of course, continuing the element of surprise, right? Trying to bring in things that students don't, don't expect in the course. So we'll come back and look a little bit more closely at this course um, later. Um, this is basically a look at one topic. So topic six in my AP micro course, I just want to show you all the different pieces of what's on here. So um, first thing is for each week, I have a date. That date is the day that class meets. What unit we're in, our topics for that week. When the test is going to be. Now this was, they were in week six, they are taking a test from the previous week. Um, so that's why it says October 7th to 10th. And my, my hybrid students in the past have had the ability to schedule when they take a test. So they aren't all taking the test at the same time, but we were doing it face-to-face. -face. Um, obviously this year, that's probably not gonna be the case. Testing will be online. And I will again talk about that at the end. Um, I tell them what the modules refer to the Krugman textbook. That's the, the content that I want them to read during the week. Here's the topics, what we're gonna be reviewing opportunity cost, what we're going to begin. And then I have a link to the learning targets. And these are coded, um, for those of you who teach AP, to the enduring understandings for the course. Then under that, I have a list of every assignment. So begin modules 52 and 54, week six practice problems on my AP, a very clear deadline, short answer, and then I have a link to the assignments that I've put in. So I give students short answer questions where I'm asking them to explain and comment on things. A forum, in this case, this particular week they're learning, we're doing production functions. So the forum discussion is, how do you tell if labor is productive? And it starts out with a question about, you know, in our class simulation, it was easy to tell the productivity of labor because we could count the number of paper links that each worker made. But in the real world, how do you tell if somebody is a productive worker? So I just want them to talk about that. How would you tell if a teacher was productive? How would you tell if a doctor or a lawyer was productive? Um, then I have a quiz, which again is interactive and gives them immediate feedback and a graphing assignment. And then they have an, their unit two review, which is an assignment that encapsulates four weeks. They just know it's out there. It's not gonna be due for, for another few weeks. Okay, then I have a cartoon right, just to entertain them. So you can read the, <laughs> the Dilbert cartoon about productivity. So try to keep them a little bit entertained. Uh, I have a question here. What do you grade and what do you not grade? Are there issues with cheating? Um, so in my school, um, two things are important to know. One is that we have 80-20 grading, which means 80% of their grade is summative and 20% of their grade is formative. 
um, everything that they are turning in, like all of these assignments that I went through here, um, all of those assignments are graded. However, they all come under formative, um, which means they don't count for very much. It's really like completion when it, when it all is said and done. Also, we use proficiency-based grading. So their assignments, if they submit them, um, as long as they like make an honest attempt, they're gonna get a three. Um, if, they, if they take a quiz and they get like, you know, 60% or something or less, they might get a two. Um, it's not very, it's not highly competitive or high stress on the assignments. It's, but if they don't do them at all, it's a huge issue. How do I deal with cheating? Um, the, a lot of them are very open-ended questions. So I will definitely, I, I grade, when I grade them, I'll look at everybody's response to question one and say question one is asking them, um, you know, what are two things that can affect a worker's productivity? If I see two students using word for word the same answer, I will, I will call them out on it. I'll ask them about it and I'll check their responses to the other ones. I, because they're so like open-ended, I don't see a lot of cheating. I'm not, so, wouldn't be surprised if the kids were talking about it, but they don't write exactly the same thing. They're putting it in their own words in the end. Um, I will talk more about testing because <laughs> obviously the summative assessments then have a huge impact on their grade. Um, so when we get to that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, in, the, in below the cartoon, you can see there are links to every one of the assignments for the week. Um, there's a PDF of the notes that I use in class. So whether I'm doing a lecture in person or if I was doing a lecture online, I always give students a PDF of my notes. Um, now I, I know and I tell them it's better for you to take your own notes by hand, but I also know that they maybe feel like they only have one chance, right? And I want them to have that material. In many cases in my course, I also provide video notes. I, I also would have a re recording of the video so the students can go back and watch it again. Um, I also give them a little forum here just to ask questions of me or of each other. If there's something they don't understand, I'll be honest, they don't make much use of that. Um, then I have a link to the short answer questions, the forum, the quiz, the graphing assignment, which can be uploaded online, and then the unit review. So when I started out, um, I had built this course, I think I'd built maybe two or three weeks of it before the semester started. And then each week I took one day and dedicated a couple hours to just each week, one week at a time. Um, I really didn't want to create the whole course in advance. Obviously it'd be a huge amount of time, but also you don't really know in advance what's gonna work and what's not. So if you have a couple weeks planned out, you can kind of monitor how those go and then decide, okay, what am I gonna do in week four? What didn't work, what did work? And then students have a calendar and I'm generally two to three weeks ahead of them. So they can call up the calendar and they can see everything that's coming up. So you'll see in this particular week, there's a lot, there's stuff every day. That's because those were all optional times for them to take a test. So we weren't actually meeting all those times. They didn't have anything due. It was just, those were options. SEMI just stands for seminar. So every Tuesday, we have seminar time listed, and then on Sundays is when their work is due. This was a sign up. They had to sign up for a group um, for something that they were doing for class. So that was due on a Friday, but that's very unusual. And then if they click on a particular day, like if they click on Sunday, October 13th, this pops up. So they can see, um, you know, everything that's due that day. So you can see they can get the same information in a lot of different ways, right? There's a lot of repetition built into this, whatever works for them, right? Some of them, I encourage them to create their own, to copy the assignments or the due dates into their Google calendar. So it pops up on their phone, right? The Moodle calendar doesn't pop up on their phone, but they can have alerts to, re to set up for themselves. And that's just a good, a good habit for them anyway. Okay, uh, I'm gonna Ma pause. Martha, I don't know if you can questions. get to this. There's yep. a question in the chat box that I think probably a lot of people have regarding tests. Are you getting to right. that? I am going to get to testing. Yep. Yep. I know it's, it's, it's near the end. And if we need to cut off something else, we can kind of buzz ahead to that. Um, no, we're, we're, to like the last we're, 15 minutes. we're on until 1130. So we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm definitely going to talk about tests. Um, how many practice problems in my EP did I assign weekly? In a regular week, I assigned about 10. Um, and then they would be assigned at the end of a unit, they would be assigned the PPC form in addition, which would be an additional, usually about 18 to 20 questions. 
um, the graphing practice. So I have typically used for graphing practice. Um, I had a, a private question about um, using Miro for graphing practice. In micro, I typically have the students do the graphing practice at home so they could do it on paper and take a picture or they could graph it online. Some kids use Word. Um, I had not used Miro as of last fall, last time I taught this course. So that will definitely be an option that I will uh, give them for next year. In my macro class, I did use Miro for graphing practice. Miro, Jamboard, kids had a lot of different options because macro was the class I was teaching in the spring when we went online. I actually taught the vast majority of my macro class online. We had started in February. We had six weeks of class, I think, before it went online last spring. Okay, simulations. So I know this is something that's important to a lot of us. Um, there are a lot of freebies out there and some of them are interactive, right? So I'm gonna show you um, one of them, the chair the fed game, I'm guessing probably all of you know um, already, but I'll show you it just in case you don't know that one. And then I'll show you the, the hopefully the money multiplier interactive from CEE. And then we'll talk about how to adapt some of the ones that we do face to face that so we can use them on on zoom or Google meets or or teams. And then there's a few things you can subscribe to. So I'm not trying to promote any one or another of those just to kind of let you know that there are some options there. So this one. Um, one of my students found a couple of years ago. Come on, come on, Link. Um, after we'd done game theory, he came in and he said, have you ever played this? <laughs> I was like, no, I've never heard of it. So it's about a 30 minute game. Um, and I'm gonna just zoom ahead a little bit. I'm turning the sound off because I can hear it and it's quite loud. Um, so this is a game of trust. You have one choice. If you put a coin in the machine, the other player gets three coins. And if they put a coin in the machine, you get three coins. You both can either choose to cooperate or cheat. So you can see this is a, a, a game theory activity, right? Let's say the other player cheats and doesn't point, put in a coin. What should you do? Well, I say cheat, right? So if they cheat, right, and if I cooperate, right, then let's see here. If I cooperate and they cheat, I lose a coin and they get three. You can see the grid looks a little bit different than the one that we use in class. If we both cheat, we both get zero. Therefore, you should cheat. But what if they cooperate? What should you do now? Well, I'm going to be a not nice person and say, if they're going to cooperate, I should cheat, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, that's mean and also correct because if you both cooperate, you both give up a coin to get three, okay? And it walks you through that. And then it actually takes kids through this as a repeated game. So it actually takes it a little bit level further than what we do in game theory in class. And you play against, let's see, I think there are, there are five different opponents, each with their own strategy, and you play between three and seven rounds. So it's just a fun extension um, and they don't need to play it against anyone. They can do this asynchronously and they can try to figure out at the end, it tells them who each of the different characters is and what their strategy was. So it's just a fun, like free, completely free online interactive um, for game theory. Another one, as I said, the chair of the Fed, um, you can obviously play, have students play this on their own. Um, I did have my macro students do this actually in breakout rooms this spring. Um, and it was a little bit different. It wasn't the easy breakout rooms that we have. It was the um, kind of breakout rooms where I had to set them all up. I had to set up Google meetings for all the kids to be with their small groups. Um, my only requirement for them was that they try to win once. They try to actually get rehired once. They could play as many times as they wanted. They could tank the economy, which is what they usually do, right? But I wanted them to at least once. And when they're in a, in a breakout room, one of them can share a screen. So you can have one kid running it and they can all be making decisions. Um, so I, I set this up for them and then they had to answer a few questions like what was the scenario you faced what decisions did you make um you know what questions did you have and did you get rehired <laughs> or did you keep your job with the fed so free simulations that are online are obviously you know the best um i'm going to see if the ce high school economics one is going to work last i tried it last week when i was doing a workshop and it was down, so I let them know. <laughs> so we'll see if it's working now. Um, this is what happened last time. Like, no, no, it's not working. So if it's not working, 
um, we won't do it today. Oh, that's funny, cheap videos. Okay, so I'm guessing that they have not fixed this yet, so I don't want to waste time on it. Um, but yeah, I, they, they know that it's not working right now, so hopefully they will fix it. But this um, interactive visual on the money multiplier is, is super useful too. Yep, fiscal ship is a great freebie. Yep, so the more we can share these, um, oh, good. Oh, that's unfortunate that the EU Central Bank one is going away. Okay, let's go to some adaptations then. All right, so we're going to play this one. Um, if you can quick take a screenshot or take a, sh a, a picture on your phone, we're going to play a fun game theory game called Paper Scissors. Um, and you're going to be sent to the breakout room. It doesn't matter. You're, you're going to be in a new breakout room because there's only going to be two of you um, so that you can, you can be player one and player two. And you're, it's like rock, paper, scissors, except uh, it's only paper and scissors. So you do one, two, three. If you both pick paper, write down plus one. If you both pick scissors, you each write down minus two. And you can see if one of you picks scissors, they get plus two. One of you picks paper, they get minus one. Um, and you are going to um, play it for a few minutes. I'm not going to give you very much time. You're going to get called back from the breakout rooms. Um, so keep track of your score. Okay, any questions about that? Hey, Mars, I have a question. How many people are you putting into a breakout room? Um, aiming for two. And, well, I ask that because some people won't join. So do you have, like with your students, you can make them join. But I know some people here probably walked away from their computer or that kind of deal. Ah, that is true. Three or four, maybe. So I'll make it two to three. Yeah. So you'll have to take turns if there's, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll put you in 30 rooms, two to three participants per room. We'll see how it works. Hopefully, um, hopefully we'll have two people in most rooms. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to play and we'll, we'll see what scores you guys come up with. Do keep track of how many, um, all right. Yeah, one could be a scorekeeper. Excellent, great idea. There's a question, Chris, to show the process of setting up rooms. I should be able to do that. Yeah, I think if you share your, your whole desktop. Well, I am sharing my whole desktop, though, and you guys aren't seeing it, so. Um, hmm. Okay, we're not seeing it. I thought you were just sharing the mm -mm. PowerPoint screen. Uh, you know what? Um, I will put a link. Zoom has a, a thing. That, like a step-by-step -step process, I'll put a link to that. Okay. I was going to say we could make a quick video of doing it, but that's, yeah, if there's already one made. Yeah, Zoom's got something. Yeah, so see, there's like five or six people who didn't join them. Yeah. And, yep. and I didn't join mine because if I join mine, it stops recording. Um, I found that out the hard way. All right, way. I'm going to move a few people. Let's yeah, see. Let's see. Um, yeah, like... Uh, like I'm probably supposed to be in Ashley Brown's room, maybe, but that's okay. I just moved Rachel. Hopefully, she'll move. If I'd been monitoring from the start instead of talking, I would would have gotten that. Okay, I'll Hi, put Martha. Josh in ten. Hi, Martha. Hi. Can you send me back to um, breakout room twenty nine. Breakout room twenty nine. Yeah, where were you? Twenty nine. You were, you got lost? And so I told her I would leave the breakout room and come back in it. Oh, it's not letting me move you back to yours. Do you not have a button on the bottom where you can put join? Oh, breakout room. Yep, there it is. Okay. Okay, most people have somebody with them. Joel looks like he's alone. Oh, he's back here. Joel just came back in here, yeah. No one in 30. I'm sorry. I, was, I, I moved you to a different room, I think. But I'm going to call people back. 
that, well, this is one of those things that would be easier when you have a captive audience and you know you have 13 kids. Yeah. And you know. It's <laughs> yeah. different with teachers. It, it just is. Teachers. Yeah, very true. Not in a, in a bad way, just, it, you know, your students are different. They know they're, they're expecting to do work and all this is where you're just more modeling. So it's a little different. Yeah, no, very true. Very true. Sometimes <clears> you run into the same things, though. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hey, Martha, this is Joel. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, quickly, um, I was messing around with the Mentimeter poll creation. Um, and when you create the word cloud uh, for the first time, like the question is a prompt, like on your Google slide or something. Is that correct? Uh, you never type in the prompt on uh, the uh, Mentimeter poll. Is that accurate? Oh my gosh, you're testing my memory um, because I, oh. I set it up and I don't actually remember, but I think that's all I had to do was set it up on my, um, okay. for, the, for the word cloud. I think I just had to set it up on the, on the Google slide. All right, I'll, I'll play around with this some more though. Thanks. Yep. All right, um, I think everyone's back. Chris, you may need to share that again. I don't know if everybody got the video if they were not in the main Oh, that's room true, time. Yeah. and I'm gonna share the whole chat as well. Awesome, so um, Chris is sharing a chat on managing breakout rooms. I am sharing my entire screen right now and it doesn't, you can't see what I'm doing. So I don't know, um, I don't exactly know how to show you how to, how to do the work behind the scenes. Um, some of you didn't have anyone in your breakout room. I was chatting at the beginning, and so that was my bad. I was talking to Chris about um, how to show people how to create breakout rooms. If I had been paying attention, I could have seen right away which breakout rooms had only one person and moved people. Um, and I could have given you a heads up about that. But that, so there's, there's learn by doing. Um, <laughs> that didn't work out for everyone. Okay, but it did work out for some people. Um, I saw Bridget, Nora, and Pamela were all in breakout room too. How, can you guys tell one of you report to me how you did? Oh, they said it, we had fun. Okay, good. So um, who won? I'll talk. Okay. Um, it actually, it worked really well. Um, and I, I typed in the chat because I had that happen also, Martha, where people wouldn't go into those breakout rooms in APSIs. But um, I also have called on a student who fell asleep in a, in a little canvas thing. So it's kind of funny when it happens and the kids are super apologetic, but we had fun and we all colluded and we just kept saying, hey, everybody hit paper. So the three of us had a really good time. Awesome. Okay, good. Did anybody have a situation where somebody cheated and won? I'll jump in again. That, um, I was, I'm Bridget. Yes, yes. we were cheating. There were times when we were cheating. <laughs> so, and it, we actually talked that it pays to cheat, right, Nora? <laughs> Sadly, true. When I do this with my students, they, they are, pretty good at cheating they're pretty now but now some of the kids figured out last year um in my class it was pretty funny because of course we were doing this live um that they if they collaborated and they did it fast they just kept going paper 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 and they ran up their scores and i was like hey that works and then, of course at the very end one of them goes scissors right when they see that the time is going to be up um but it's a fun it's very easy to do um in a breakout room we're going to do a little different activity some of you probably use the, um, the, the public and private rooms um, two boxes activity. Um, this is one to help students understand the free rider problem. And I don't wanna to spend too long explaining it. I just wanna kind of show you how it can work online. So if you're, if you're not sure what's going on with it, don't, don't worry about it. Um, the idea of this is you want each student to imagine that they have 10 tokens or 10 units of income. And they have to decide how much to allocate toward public goods. And in this activity, um, I actually, I, I don't use the economic definition of public goods. We, the kids understand what economic definition of public goods is, but I include quasi-public goods in this box. And I say, um, it's not just going to be, um, you know, tornado sirens and, and, and military. It's the public box is going to include quasi-public goods that the, the government has could provide for us like roads and schools and parks, right? I don't want to get really technical in this game about that, that definition. And then private goods are things that 
of course, are rivalrous and only you can consume. And I'm basically just doing rivalrous, non-rivalrous. I'm not getting into excludability. Um, and you have to decide how to allocate your 10 units of income. And if I'm doing this live in class, um, each student is going to write down how much they are putting in the public box on like a note card or a post-it note, and they're going to, to hand them in. Um, the total that is placed in the public box after everybody has turned in their cards gets multiplied by two and then divided among all the participants. So if we have, let's say, 30 students, if all 30 students put all 10 units of income in the public box, that would be 300 units of income. It would be multiplied by two, so it would become 600 units of public goods and then divided by the, the number of students again it would basically double their money. So they would put in 10, they would get out 20. That's the idea is if we all share, if we all put everything in for the public good, we all get, get double our money. Um, and the way you can do this online is simply have every student private chat the number that they would put in the public box. So we don't want them sharing with everyone, which is what I did when I was doing this as a, um, during an APSI. Um, the two boxes activity came from the CE High School Economics book. It's in that orange high school economics book. Okay, so if a couple people want to share with me what you would put in the public box, you can just kind of test this out. Just share me a private message and tell me here's what I'm going to put in the public box. Okay, you guys are doing this great because I've got a whole variety um, and, and it, this would work out really well. So I had at least one of you who put nothing in the public box, right? And I got more than one. Okay, I got a couple people putting nothing in the public box. And in my class, I, I asked the students to, to give me permission if they want me, if I can share their name. Um, and so I go through and I talk about particular individuals. I didn't ask you guys for permission to share your name, so I'm not going to call anybody out for, for saying zero. Um, but I would, in class, call attention to the fact that that person wins, right? Because they get the shares of everything in the public box, plus they get their 10 private units. And of course, the kids get really frustrated. Um, but it's an easy activity to adapt to doing online in this kind of format. Okay. And then I included two subscriptions. So Mob Lab is something that I don't know if any of you have tried this. Please share in the chat if you've used Mob Lab. They were at the CEE High School or CEE National Conference a couple of years ago. And that's the first time I interacted with them. And they have developed, you can see here a little screenshot, a whole ton of auctions and other activities um, to do online. And I know college professors use their services and they've got great people on their staff. It is a per student fee, it's 12 bucks per student for high school. So yeah, it's, it's definitely not free. Um, I've been testing it out with some, some of my students who are on econ team this summer and they've enjoyed it, um, but I need to work on like whether I think it's worth it to pay for it for my class or not. And then Glacier Peak is a business simulator, so it's a little bit different if you teach business. I know when I was at, in Georgia, um, for a workshop last January, I introduced the students to that, and that gives kids an opportunity to essentially make some business decisions. It's not really an econ, as econ oriented, but if you're, if you're a business teacher as well, you know, you may want to check that one out. Oh, cool. A student's day was a rep. Yeah, the kids, the kids do love it, and yeah, I know. It's 12 bucks is a lot of money if you add up to a lot of kids, so maybe you could try to negotiate with them if you have a lot of students. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, like I said. I'm not sure if I'm going to try to do Mob Lab. If I feel like, you know, the activities are engaging enough, they have so many of them that you could literally use it every week in microeconomics. So if I was going to use it every week, I would, I would try to. Um, Glacier Peak is, I think they're doing site licenses. So you would, you would, you know, you could go on their site and contact them. I'm not, Honestly, every time I just tell someone what their pricing model is, it turns out that I'm wrong. So I'm going to, it's probably pretty similar. I would say uh, probably $10, $12 per person. Okay. Um, oh my gosh, 20 minutes left. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> so um, I did mention earlier having discussions, right? That, that having discussions in asynchronous online learning is super, super important. And I will confess I don't think I've done the best job of it, and I intend to do a lot better job at it this year. Um, I, I think I set up good discussions, 
but I don't think I did enough to to maintain them and monitor them and make sure that they were more than just a, um, you know, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post something so I get credit. So this is an example of one of the discussions I had. Um, it's, it's something we do in the first week in micro. It's, you know, they're going to watch this video and I'll show you it for just a second of Daniel Pink's explanation of the latest research on incentives. Um, explains who Daniel Pink is, and then students have to post a response and two responses to other student comments. Um, does this research on incentives contradict or merely expand on economic theories? Why do you think higher pay leads to worse performance? What could explain this phenomenon? And then would you prefer to take a job that pays more or a job with autonomy, mastery, and purpose? Now, a few things I'm going to do, and I'll, I'll show you a, a minute of that Daniel Pink video because I, I love it for economics. Um, is it's really, first of all, we need to train students in how to have these discussions. Just putting a discussion out there does not mean that students are going to participate in any meaningful way. So explaining to them synchronously if possible, um, but talking to them about how do you talk to other people online. Um, one thing we want them to do is we want them to learn to ask questions. So when you're reading what somebody else says, right, think about what can I say, how can I ask a question that elevates this discussion? And then we have to model that. So I need to read what my students post. I always read what they post, but I frequently don't add or comment. Um, but I'm definitely going to be asking probing questions to try to, well, why do you think that? Or what did, what, how was that shown in this video? I am going to assign leaders, meaning I'm not going to next year, I am not going to have every student make an initial post. Because if you have too many threads, it's overwhelming. But if I assign three or four students each week, you're going to make the initial post and everybody's just going to respond to you. And then you need to ask some guiding questions. I think that's going to make the, the discussions a whole lot more effective. I've also just given them points for doing it, but I think I'm going to be a little clearer um, about a rubric for it. It's going to be on the, it's going to be on the three, two, one scale. We don't give four, we don't give mastery points for practice assignments. Um, but to earn a three, I'm going to expect that, that students, you know, that they build upon the discussion, that they ask questions of each other, that they bring in the original source material like you would in, a, in, a, in an in-person Socratic seminar. So I'm going to show you just a minute of this video. I'm going to have to stop sharing so I can reshare with, um, with sound. Life is filled with trying times, but so often it all comes down to what you make. Our motivations are unbelievably interesting. I mean, it, I, I find I've been working on this for a few years and I just find the topic still so amazingly engaging. And, and interesting. So I want to tell you about that. The science is really surprising. The science is a little bit freaky, okay? It, we are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There's a whole set of unbelievably interesting studies. I want to give you two that call into question this idea that if you reward something, you get more of the behavior you want. If you punish something, you get less of it. So let's talk, let's go from London to the mean streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts in the northeastern part of the United States. And let's talk about a study done at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Here's what they did. They took a whole group of students, and they gave them a set of challenges, things like um, memorizing strings of digits, uh, solving word puzzles, other kinds of spatial puzzles, even physical tasks like throwing a ball through a hoop. Okay, they gave them these challenges, and they said to incentivize their performance, they gave them three levels of rewards. Okay? So if you did pretty well, you got a small monetary reward. If you did medium well, you got a medium monetary reward. And if you did really well, if you were one of the top performers, you got a large cash prize. Okay? We've seen this movie before. This is essentially a typical motivation scheme within organizations, right? We reward the very top performers. We ignore the low performers and the folks kind of in the middle. Okay, you get a little bit. So what happens? They do the test, they have these incentives, here's what they found out. One, 
As long as the task involved only mechanical skill, bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the performance. Okay, that makes sense. But here's what happens. But once the task called for even rudimentary cognitive skill, a larger reward led to poorer performance. Now, this is strange, right? A larger reward led to poorer performance? How can that possibly be? Now, what's interesting about this is that these folks here who, who, who did this are all economists, at, at, two at MIT, one at the University of Chicago, one at Carnegie Mellon, okay? The top tier of the economics profession. And they're reaching this conclusion that seems contrary to what a lot of us learned in economics, which is, which is that the higher the reward, the better their performance. And they're saying that once you get above rudimentary cognitive skill, Okay, sorry, I'm cutting you off. <laughs> I know, I love watching that video. Um, I totally encourage you to show it to, to your students um, in micro, because it gives them so much to think about. But um, I, I know that we're running short on time. So um, you can watch that on your own. I think uh, it, it, it leads, that one leads to a really healthy discussion among the students, because some see that um, we can't just talk about incentives as monetary and that autonomy, mastery, and purpose, they make the argument that, that that fits into economic theory. It's just a different type of incentive, but it doesn't deny the role of incentive. So anyway, it's, it's a good one to just kind of get students. I always like to get them to, to challenge their thinking about, about what they're learning in microeconomics. So they're not just swallowing it like, like being spoon fed. Okay. Um, a few other things, and that was very brief on discussions. I apologize. We probably could have a whole, you know, webinar just on discussions. Um, but a few other things that we should include. One is, of course, for asynchronous, you want them to have practice with feedback. These are how quizzes show up in Moodle. Um, so when students take a quiz, you know, they, they answer the questions on here, and then they get an immediate score of feedback. They get to see what they got wrong or right. Now, typically with these, Moodle allows you a whole lot of controls. So I typically don't let them see their score or what they got wrong or right until everybody's taken the quiz. So whenever, once we've passed the deadline, then they can see. So it's unfortunate they don't get that immediate feedback, but it does allow me a little bit more security. Um, sometimes I do set these up so that they can take them twice. So they can do it the first time, get the feedback and then they have a delay maybe of 24 hours and then they can take it a second time. So there's a lot of controls to play with depending on what you want to achieve with each particular um, assessment. I also am a big believer in, in meetings <laughs> with kids and if you're, if you're uh, online, you know, a lot of kids this spring, you know, if I felt like I wasn't sure that the students understood what was going on, um, we could do this live. You know, we could have 10 minutes where, you know, we go through a couple of questions and I ask them to talk through their responses so that I could be confident that they were actually doing their own work. And I, I think that's the, the absolute best thing I found is, you know, if I want to know if a student's cheating or not, I, I say, let's set a face-to-face -face appointment. Uh, we'll take 10 minutes and have them talk me through their response to something. And it, it becomes pretty clear if it was their work or not. And once students become aware that that's an expectation, it definitely diminishes their incentive to cheat, um, especially on open-ended type questions. Okay, I included a few more examples here of things that you, you could have um, you know, discussions about or how to, how to bring in some real-world examples. The best incentive we just watched, um, this article, is there really a toilet paper shortage? Um, I, had my I had my students discuss things like whether or not we should tax soft drinks as an attempt to, um, you know, cut down on obesity. Uh, I have them discuss different, uh, I give them a handout with descriptions of four or five different monopolistic sorts of firms like Comcast and the post office and uh, the NCAA and ask them to discuss what they think is the best example of monopoly. So just trying to have them engage with the terms um, and use real world examples. I found an article um, that some graduate student did on the MRP of LeBron James. So I have them look at that and like, is this a legitimate analysis? And of course the kids who are, who are into sports really, really love that example. Um, you know, you can go to unemployment statistics and I included the links on here, the Janet Yellen video from AP Live this spring. There's just a lot of things we can build into our learning management systems that give kids the opportunity to see real world applications of 
economics. Okay, I know I'm talking really fast here, but I'm seeing the, the writing on the wall in terms of our time and now my phone won't tell me what time it is. So, um, okay, 10.20. Yeah, uh, you, have, you have about 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah okay, great. <laughs> so ten, 10 official minutes and then you hang around however long you want. Okay, I see a couple of comments in here. Um, how do I manage the, the um, grading, planning, sharing examples, making presentations, all of that? Um, I would say it definitely is difficult. Um, like I said, I planned out, I planned out my micro course in week at a time chunks. And I didn't have, you know, a synchronous lecture every day. Um, some things take longer to plan than others. Also, um, one thing I found, I loved having that course so much that I set up a lot of things for my macro course just so that students would have online resources, even though it was a normal face-to-face -face class. Um, because once you create them once, you have them in the future. So if you have to teach online this fall, um, and you're thinking, I don't ever want to do this again, but if you, if you create some things like interactive online quizzes or discussions, um, even if your class is face-to-face -face next year, there might be some of those pieces that, that you'll want to use. So I know it, it took me a while to set things up, but it takes me a lot less time now. So big investment at the front, but not as much sort of ongoing maintenance. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the, um, I'm hoping the College Board will give us information for, for AP for the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on some of the more of the questions now, just because I know I, I can stay and answer them, but some people will need to go. So I wanna make sure I get through a little bit more of this. Um, tools. You know, having video conference software with breakout rooms is huge. So urge your school to have that. Monitor what's happening with Google Meets. Um, put comments into Google Meets and give them feedback like we need the breakout rooms now. If you can't do breakout rooms, you can set up individual meetings for teams of students. So you can assign students to teams and create their own meeting and you can set it up to repeat. So you really only have to do it once. And every day when you have class, this is what I did last spring because I, I didn't have breakout rooms. I set up my students so that when class started, they would come to a Google Meet with me. Um, we would do a quiz, we would do some review, I would tell them what their assignment was. And then they had their own calendar invites that I had created with their small group. When you create the small groups, you can always join them. So I could jump in and join them and see that they were doing the work. Now, my school had an expectation of synchronous time. Um, this year, it's going to be less. Uh, I'm going to have an expectation of about, if we go online, only one hour probably of synchronous time each week. So I wouldn't be able to hold them accountable for showing up every day to those meetings. But what I found was my students loved having the chance to meet with each other. They absolutely, that was the, that's why they came to class every day because 20 to 30 minutes of class was in a, a breakout room basically talking to their, their classmates which was something they weren't getting to do all the time, right? They're stuck at home by themselves. So they were solving problems. They were working on macro problems, but they were with their friends. And it actually was a big incentive for them just to show up. Um, a writable surface of some type is great. Um, I, I have this screen on my computer is writable. Um, you might have an iPad. I also have a document camera. Something you can use that's gonna be interactive. I, now, I know I'm totally being, you know, contradictory here because I'm using a PowerPoint with you guys. I, I don't use PowerPoint with my students at all. Um, I don't want to have prepared slides for them. I'm going to teach them just as I would, you know, normally in front of a classroom, drawing gra graphs live, um, showing them the circular flow diagram by starting with four boxes and filling in the boxes. I, I don't, that's, and that's part of the re way I cut down on the amount of prep time. Um, if you're not creating as many slides, then you're not really having to spend as much time preparing in advance if you can do things live. A discussion board, it's really, really helpful if whatever online resources you're using, you can have that discussion board so that students can be interacting and talking about topics. So nice to haves, of course, as I mentioned, a document camera, and I'm gonna actually, um, just show you mine just for a second. I know not everybody has one. I, I bought this myself. Um, you can see it right there, right? And so that's what I use. If I'm gonna be drawing a graph with my students, um, I'm gonna be starting it like this, right? I'm gonna be like P, Q, 
supply, demand. I'm not doing this very professionally right now, so I'm not taking a lot of time um, to draw it really carefully or make sure that you can see it well. I do spend a lot more time lining that up. Uh, let's see if I can do it with a marker. When I'm doing- Are um, we supposed to be seeing what you're doing? Can you not see it? No. Can, can you, um, if you look at my picture, if you pin me, yeah, or put it on spotlight. speaker view? Yeah, yeah, hold on, yeah, I'll spotlight you. Yeah. If you put it on speaker view? I got it, yep. There you go. I was, doing, okay, I was making a, sure everybody could see it no matter how. That was a very terrible video or little graph that I made there. Okay. So if I was going to do this with my students, I would be much more careful to, <clears throat> I have, it's really funny. I, I really didn't take the time to set up this, this ahead of time today, but which is why it's at a weird angle. Huh? Okay. I'm going to have to figure out what I did with my document camera because it's, it's coming out opposite. Um, are you seeing it? Are you seeing it a weird angle? Or are you seeing it correct? Yeah, it needs to be rotated left 180 degrees. Somehow. Yeah, okay. I, I don't, oh. We get the idea, we get the idea. Yeah. You get the idea. Anyway, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really prepare to use that today, but it, it, that's how I do but most of my live drawing is um, by using that camera. And I bought that for like, I think I spent 100 bucks on it, which I know is a lot of money, but um, it's not, it wasn't like $500. It's not a super professional one. Um, other things that are really nice to have are things like, obviously, the ability to show video clips, um, good lighting, good sound. If you can, I, you can see I don't have a green screen behind me, um, but I do have a, a little halo light that just makes the lighting a little bit better. Before, I used to be always super washed out whenever I was doing any kind of um, video. So trying to practice that is really helpful. Okay, I see a few people. I use my cell phone camera sitting on a milk crate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. Practice, you know, practice kind of seeing how you look and how you're going to look in the camera. And don't do what I just did with my, my document camera. Okay. Um, I think what I'm going to do, oh my gosh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead to the um, assessment because I think I talked to you through a sample week before. Um, and then if we have time, we can come back to that. I kind of went through time to talk about each kind of class. Um, but I'm going to spend the last few minutes just talking about assessment and then um, I can answer questions or we can go back to um, anything from earlier. So the first thing I would say about assessment is give students multiple ways to show what they know. So give them the opportunity to show what they know by having to answer open-ended questions. So any student can copy a graph that shows, for example, the marginal cost curve going through the minimum ATC. Not everyone can explain why that happens. And I think you wanna give students as much as possible that opportunity to express um, their understanding. Now, they may wanna do it, um, they may not like doing it in writing, they may wanna do it, be able to explain it face to face with you. You can use things like Flipgrid, which again, <laughs> one more resource, right? Super easy to use if you, Flipgrid accounts are free. If you, if you set it up, all you have to do is put a question and kids can go on as long as they have a camera, they can record themselves answering it. So you can say, explain why it is that MC crosses ATC at its minimum. And kids can just on Flipgrid record themselves saying it if they don't wanna have to type it. So there's a lot of ways that students can show us what they know. In terms of actual tests, free response is far from perfect, but it's better than multiple choice online, right? It, it, you're gonna have more assurance that the students are going to be showing their actual work if they're doing free response. So I'm gonna show you how I set up my test this spring in just a second. If you are in doubt about a student's understanding, give them the opportunity to present to you, right? Have them talk it through with you either in the live one-on-one -on -one if you can, or um, you know, by recording themselves explaining it. So this is the test that I gave my students. Um, this spring, my AP macro students, I had about, I had two sections, about 70 kids. Um, they were mostly freshmen. Uh, and they, the way I set it up, you're going to see a lot of little, little uh, kind of rules in, in here. So I gave them a time limit. Now I know some people might debate that or might think that's unfair. Um, they're going to have a time limit on the AP test. So I was like, okay, you're going to have 55 minutes to view this test once you open it. The questions are drawn randomly from a question bank. As it says here, answer all calculation and explanation questions in the response box provided. 
you will have three minute grace period to submit once time is up. When they, after they did question one and moved on to question two, they were not allowed to go back to question one. So just like with the AP test. Um, so if they took a long time with question one and they were, for example, asking a friend or looking up answers, right, they would, they would essentially run out of time for number two. Um, the I did require them to graph, unlike the AP test. I expected them to draw graphs. Um, they had to draw them on paper. I didn't want them using Jamboard because I knew they could share. So their graphs had to be hand drawn um, and they had to indicate which was for the first question, which was for the second question, right? And then they could take a picture with their phone and email it to me, send me a screenshot. So they got one attempt on the test. Uh, once they logged in, that 55 minute timer started um, and they had to have a password to log in. So there were a lot of little things to kind of help me along the way. Um, in the, in the sort of background, there were 12, I, I, on this test I put 15, I typed in 15 FRQs from released AP exams. So they were, every kid when they logged in, their questions were randomly selected. So like, I, you know, in terms of to trying to prevent cheating, definitely made it a lot harder for them to cheat, right? Because they might have their friend that they're texting and they're like, my first question is this. And their friend's like, well, my question is totally different, right? The odds that two kids got the same question number one were not great, right? So they, they, they really did have to, um, you know, rely on themselves. They couldn't go back. The time limit was enforced. And as I said, it was password protected. So for feedback, I had to go through and grade all of these, which as you can imagine was not super fun, right? Because different rubrics. Um, what I found most helpful was when I designed the test, I didn't do this with unit three and it could cost me a lot of time later. When I designed the unit four test, each time I, I created the question, I printed off the rubric. So as soon as I put the question in the question bank, I printed the rubric and I had a little packet of the rubrics labeled by question. On Moodle, when I looked at their responses, it told me which question they answered. So I could just turn to the right rubric page and be able to score it. And then I just did it like one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 right? Went through, after I got through about 10 of them, I got pretty good at it. It did take a little bit. Um, I did not give students basically any written feedback. They got their score on proficiency-based grading, a four, three, two, one. Um, if they got a two or one, then I emailed the student and their parents and I said, I want to give you oral feedback on what you missed on this question. And I went through it with them in an online video chat. So it was pretty elaborate to give them all this feedback. And then they did have the opportunity to do a retake. Um, the retake was the same test. I made a copy of the test. Um, and I said, I, here are the two questions you answered the first time. You may not answer those again. <laughs> so if that question pops up for you, you need to skip it and move on. So I did make sure that when they did the retake, they got different questions, but they weren't able to go back in and look at them again. So there was no way for a, a kid really to share with another kid. Now, I, I realized they could take screenshots when they were doing it. Um, you know, they could have, if they put a lot of effort into it, gotten together with their friends, found all 15 questions, done them all together. I, I figure if you're going to put that much effort into it and you're going to solve all these questions together, you're learning. <laughs> so I wasn't particularly worried about that sort of high level. Um, collaboration. Um, if I had been doing AP questions, and I did this just for um, a few a few quizzes with students, um, I did have some students use the lockdown browser, but I couldn't require it of my students um, because they hadn't put them on the school Chromebooks. So that was a very unusual situation. But if we're able to put the lockdown browser on school Chromebooks, I would definitely um, use that for assessments this year. And then this is a look at kind of what the students see. So you can see up in the corner here, time left, right? Uh, you can navigate, but if you go to two, you can't go back to one. So I did have some kids who ran into trouble with that. I went to two and I can't go back to one. They had to do a retake. Like I told you a hundred times, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to go back to number one. You can't just scan out the questions. But this probably looks familiar to anybody who teaches AP, right? It's, you know, Clark Consulting Services. So students had to type in all the calculation explanation and then they would separately email me their graphs. Okay, so that was a lot of, um, you know, just sort of nitty gritty there about testing. Um, I see a few more questions. Yeah. Um, 
does Google Classroom have the ability to randomize the FRQs? That I don't know, because I have always used Moodle for my courses. So I don't know if somebody else knows that about randomizing them. Um, okay, I am going to pause for a second and see any questions or anything if people want to go back to sort of that planning out a course, you know, kind of how do you break down a course into this, this week by week schedule, we can do that. And if, and if you need to go or you, or you want to go, we've certainly hit the, um, we've gone five minutes past, so I totally understand. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Like I said, I will hang out here for a few more minutes uh, as long as we need to, um, and we can also continue to record. So, yeah. Martha, let me thank you on behalf of the Georgia Council and for everyone, and I'm, I'm willing to hang out for a little bit too. Um, it looks like there were a lot of good comments coming through. Uh, everyone will get, uh, I'll make sure Martha gives me the link to the new slides. I have the old ones, but I'll get the link to the new ones. I'm going to send you a survey in your email and a copy of the chat as well. This recording will go on our YouTube page. I'm sorry, our YouTube channel. Uh, I don't know. Don't hold me to this, but maybe tomorrow morning. Um, it takes a while to get it edited and put up there. But um, yeah, so thanks everybody for joining. If you want to hang out, welcome to for a little bit. I'll keep the meeting up, but I think I will stop recording so I can go ahead and get that started. Um, shifting down and uh, yeah, appreciate everyone. And thank you, Martha. We appreciate you. Thank you. I'm answering a few questions. I really appreciate all of you. It's great to see so many friendly faces and uh, happy to happy to hang out here and answer any questions or go back to anything.